have Mark Nevu, our uh, new history theory uh, professor that we're very happy to have here at Wentworth. Uh, have you, are you taking? You're not taking class. Most of you are not. Some of you are. Okay. They're all the ones frowning. Yeah. Um, then Felipe Delmont, who you all had the pleasure, some of you had the pleasure of being in his studio this semester. All of you had the pleasure of having him as a guest uh, instructor uh, in July. Uh, Jim Costaris, who has taught here on and off, uh, as well as uh, a long period teaching at Harvard and a long period of um, uh, a prominent role in the Boston Redevelopment Authority. Uh, uh, my student, is it possible? Yeah, possible. Yeah. And um, has taught the community design studio uh, in the past, um, and we sorely missed. Um, uh, Ian Baldwin, who uh, many of you may have taken classes with him. No. No, none of you. Two, 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 two former students. Okay, two former students. But he's been teaching here, Northeastern VISTI. Uh, where else? Uh, yeah, that's not it. Okay. Um, and uh, last but not least, uh, Bill Bean, who you also had the pleasure of having as a guest instructor this summer, and who has also uh, been sorely missed in the past few years as someone who has made remarkable contributions as an adjunct here at Wentworth, uh, especially in the community design studio, but also uh, teaching collective on social engagement these points. Okay. Um, and these are our authors. Uh, we get to know them. To ask general questions of the authors uh, about the general uh, premise of the book or any, any questions that you might have of a more general nature um, about the project. <coughs> I'll start out. I just, first I want to say that went through the book. I didn't read it in detail. I, it's, there's a lot to read and a lot I want to read and I will go through it. But uh, my general impression is that um, uh, you all did a, just a phenomenal job. This is such a interesting and I would say important um, uh, you know, area of inquiry. Uh, and it's just great to see the work that you've done. Um, my question is, uh, th th this is you know, this is kind of a hard to define concept, but there's definitely a concept that's you know, emerging. But so, two questions: How do you understand this concept of reflexivity uh, in terms of the practice of architecture and, by extension, urban design? And do you think it's useful, or or not? You know, you've done the work. You've what do you think? Um, I think that it is really useful because we're starting to understand that we're looking at architecture in a different way yeah. than uh, in the past where we're like taking not just what happened in the past but what what's happening currently and how we can yeah. use like the feedback we get to respond to our uh, built environment. Yeah. So it's it's really helpful to know that there's a new way to start How do you see understanding. This, uh, changing the practice, you know, conventional practice of architecture. That's um, as, as a future architect. How, how is this now? Yeah. Well, how this be different? I could see it like um, being a lot more interactive with um, the the communities that it's affecting and the. Yeah. Um, the clients and all that because I feel like it's it is a lot more engaging with like what the needs are like and as they change and I think that the architect will play a more active role in the whole life of a project rather than just the uh, the before stage yeah. so. Great. Great. Um, I defined this, well, in the beginning, I kind of saw it as a cause and effect, mm -hmm. and that was pretty much the, uh, one of the more downfalls in the beginning, because it's not really a cause and effect. The whole point of it is that you do something, 
or the building will do something, or something that is set up by the architect, can, something can be done which will eventually come back, and that's the idea of the circuit, is that once something is set up or some type of program, um, you can almost ease back and let this you know, take control of itself. Um, and then amongst ourselves, we've had debates of if the architect is monitoring it or if it's user control, but it's something that becomes almost self-generated once it's started. So the, the sort of circuitry or electronic technology. Yeah, so it could be something that's like physically like technology where you know the building will monitor itself and do something, or it could be something as easy as creating a social movement where something happens where people take control of themselves and they want to do it because you know, it's amongst themselves now, it's not someone telling them. Lawrence go elaborate on that a little. I almost see it as kind of an adaptation, a continuing adaptation that contributes to patterns being created that can contribute to other patterns and then further on the adaptation process and kind of a circle going back and forth into, say, social interaction, like creating paths or creating spaces that people will, you know, generate towards. So I think it's creating more of a system. Is that a good thing? Is that always a good thing? It may not always be a good thing, but I think it's somewhere to start. It's a what? It's a start. It's a start. I think it's an evolutionary process, again, like with an adaptation. It's, you can take one aspect of something and then one aspect of another thing. And that's kind of back to that feedback loop where you try something and you may not get everything positive out of it. You may get negatives, you may get positives, but it's what you do with both of those that influence your next input. Make a value judgment between different reflex, reflexive acts. How do you know that architecture is good or bad? How do you know when you're designing something that, given the context that you're setting forth, right, that it will be responded to in some way, it will be reflected on, or will be reflexive in some way? How do you know what's good? How do you decide? Well, I think you could kind of look at it in um, this reflexive um, realm and see if people are inhabiting your space but reflexively they're changing it clearly you've done something wrong but if people are like living in it and they continue to thrive and they don't have to change much and they're obviously going to have to adapt a little bit but i think the more successful it is probably the less you you have to change i'd assume it puts a lot on the onus of the of the, of the architect Right. Well, yeah. It seems to me that the sort of value of the reflexive argument is that there's an openness to it, right? Going back right. to Echo's open work, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, for example, let me give you a percent. We're talking a lot of abstracts here. Let me put something very precisely. So let's talk about the World Trade Center, right? When it was designed um, in the 70s, do you think it was designed as a symbol for Western economic dominance? Probably not. Not at all, right? Maybe. I don't know, right? I doubt it, though. It seems like it had other intentions to mm -hmm. it or something else. The building then, after 9-11, 2001, becomes something very, very different, right? So the architect probably could not foresee, although he was, he's probably the only architect who's had two enormously important buildings uh, implode on themselves. That's another story. Uh, but They know that story. They know that story. Good. Right. I have seven yeah. exact words. Yeah. It's a horrible fate, I have to say. My point, though, is that if, if the work is always open, if the work is always open for interpretation, if we're going to say that it's open, if it's reflexive in the way that you've just described it, biological analogy, how do you decide? Does it even matter to have an intention? Does it matter what you do? I think that um, sort of the goal, maybe for the future, is the, more so than um, that the people not being able or not needing to change it, is to decide in a open way so that the people have the power to change it. So um, it becomes more of an intera interactive relationship to the inhabitants of each building. That it doesn't, um, it's not that it's designed in such a fantastic way that they don't have to interact with the building at all, but it's designed in conjunction with the inhabitants so that they want to change it and we want to allow them to do that. And so the designer of the building and the inhabitant talk all throughout the same. My argument is that that is a constant. That this space, for example, that we're sitting in right now, is probably not conceived as a classroom space organized in the way that we have it. Right? It's conceived in very different ways. Right? The organization of this, the studio, with these chairs, with these desks, such the crisp spaces in the middle, set up a very sort of distinct mode of pedagogy. We're altering that right now. 
right? We're having this sort of weird, sorry, Robert, uh, somewhat strange um, conversation going on. Yeah. Um, notwithstanding the blob in the center of the room, um, but I think we're this happens anyways. Is my point. Right? This always, always happens. Right? Except when it doesn't. I mean, why aren't we in our classroom? Because that doesn't change. I don't know. It doesn't allow you to change. Well, yeah, I think, think, think yeah. case, I think that a lot of um, the reflexive um, techniques that we use is trying to give people a framework in which to you know like work and be able to adjust things in an easier way than that what we had to do. I mean, we had to get all these chairs and line them up, but if we had if we had say tables that were on tracks that easily slid back and forth so you could push them right. over there. The like, argument isn't about sort of uh, modularity or interactive right. architecture or anything like that. What I'm saying is that the, the reception of work, if we put it that way, the, the way that the work is understood uh -huh. and translated, interpreted, however it might be, is always, always, always open. And so right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make the argument here that the, the, the notion of reflexivity is presented here is constant, no matter what, always has been. We go back to Rossi's proposal for a, a critique of naive functionalism and that the form of the building stays the same and the program constantly changes as Tom and Eric know oh so well, this conversation. Uh, we could talk about that, or we just talk about Berto Eco's reading of the open work where stuff where architecture is constantly being reinterpreted, constantly being reappropriated. If that's the case, what's the what is the point of reflexivity in design? How do we take account of that more than just making things modular? If that's a constant thing. What do we do with it? Well, I think it could allow you to um, take the opportunity to find a way to make what is happening on the inside and all those changes like respond, like have the skin of the building respond to that in a way. I, like, I don't think we have exactly the technologies to do that right now, but I think there's a way that we could yeah. to have um, what is happening on the inside change, like the form of the building, say, or like exactly like uh, what's happening on the skin. I mean, there, I'm sure there are ways of doing that, but I think that we're moving towards something that is more respondent of what uh, activities are happening on the inside. And do you, can you think of an example? Um, like uh, micro. Yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. Um, well. Let's let's see. Um, well, it, my study was on micro units and trying to like re repurpose a space um, for living, uh, entertaining, and all the all this um, all these different functions and being able to slide walls and move those around, but. Uh, right now, like you're saying, that happens in apartments all the time, and it doesn't, it doesn't really uh, change on the outside of the building. But um, my, my point is not about the interior and exterior. But my, my point is really about the reception of work, okay. and not the, uh, the ability for work to, you know, to be read. You know, Re reception, change. how exactly? How the work is perceived, how one understands the work once it's been built, okay. and how one. Uh, what one's unconscious yeah. reaction to it is. I think, we want to change the show. I think it happens, I think it allows more things to happen on the front end of the design work and kind of bringing something that happens subconsciously. Like you said, it's a constant that's always going on. But it, I think that usually happens in the subconscious, so it's bringing that to the forefront and allowing the changes to kind of try and be anticipated during the design process so that it's not about whether the reception is good or bad, it's about trying to improve that before the building is actually placed in the built environment. Right, my, again, just trying to clarify my comment, it's not about whether the reception was good or bad, but okay. it's what the, what the meaning of the work is, how, oh. how is the work received, is, it, is the intention of the architect relevant in a completely reflexive world? Let's go with Ian. If so, how? I think that's why uh, community design is starting to be something that really is becoming oh, important. And you did, okay. Right, so yeah, but uh, anyway, what I, my point being that that's a sort of a form for people to identify the reflexive mechanisms that they want to really address in their building, mm -hmm. so they can sort of discover that, say they want a flexible community space, that's the type of thing that they would identify. This is a reflexive uh, sort of system we want to set up for ourselves, 
this is what's important to us, and that sort of is a form to a lot of people to identify which, because as you, as you mentioned, they're always going to be there, these mechanisms. So this is just a way to identify which ones you really want to address. Can I throw out a case study so that we, uh, uh, in the early 20th century, uh, one of Corbusier's early works was, um, I think it was workers' housing in Pesach, that was it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the, the architecture was, um, you know, very much, um, very much an early modern, modernist aesthetic that I know you're all familiar with. Um, it was a real departure from, you know, any architecture prior to that. Um, I'm not going to recount the history of early modernism because I think you, you get an idea what these uh, houses look like. And they were, I think they were single family houses with terraces and uh, they were row houses essentially. Well, over time, the people living in them, the, the families started adding, you know, shutters, traditional shutters to the windows, flower boxes. They started putting sort of faux gable roofs with, um, you know, the traditional uh, roof tiles that uh, is used in southern France and a lot of places. Um, so that over several decades, uh, they were almost indistinguishable from a more traditionally designed and constructed house in that area. So, you know, there were three, the reaction among architects to this, or theorists, came, well, there were many responses, but I'll give you three of them. One was that um, uh, Corbusier failed. He didn't anticipate their real needs and aspirations, and they went ahead and uh, uh, modified, dr drastically modified the houses, and they clearly, and then the other response as well, they didn't understand the modernist uh, ideology, um, you know, they somehow ignorant of uh, what the world would be in the future, and um, they they resisted, and they went ahead and you know bastardized the houses. And then the other one was uh, actually Corbusier was a, a, a genius because uh, um, he designed architecture that was robust and flexible enough so that the people who lived there over time could adapt and uh, modify uh, their homes, both in terms of program and need, but also in terms of aesthetics and the value they place on, you know, uh, stylistic aspects of architecture, and that, in fact, uh, uh, you know, this was an even more brilliant work of architecture than Corbusier uh, may have understood. Um, of course, the counter argument is, well, maybe it all turned out that way, but uh, he had one set of intentions, and the people who lived in these uh, clearly didn't share his you know, aesthetic intentions. So I, I'm just I'm throwing this out as a, uh, you know, a, a case study to get your reactions. We're, we're, unfortunately, I don't have pictures of Bizak, but what do you think? Was, uh, was, was, it, was this a failure of modernism? Was it... Um, uh, was it sort of a superstructure, an infrastructure in a way uh, that people could adapt over time in ways they wanted? Have, have any of you guys seen this picture that Jim's talking about? I, I like presented as side side part side. of my presentation. I looked at some. You did, some yeah. 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 I, I actually, I'm really curious. Um, I'm sorry, I only have your last names. And through the, through the magic of digital audio, I was actually able to listen to quite a lot. Oh, great. So, um, Demers? What, I'm curious what your answer to, that, to this is. Um, I was actually going to respond. I think that um, it's interesting because um, there's always variables. Um, there's always kind of like that intermediate uh, step where, you know, you can't always, you know, design for one specific thing. You should design for, you know, the final product. So I think it was successful in the way that he built it, making it simple for the inhabitants to be able to change it. Do you think that was his intention? Uh, I'm not a historian. I don't think, I don't I think, think he it was actually I'm going to design something that will inevitably get uh, changed. The aesthetics will be changed, probably. Um, and that's OK. I'm designing it so that people can do that. I mean, you're the historian. I'm willing to bet Corbin. Uh, well, you tell me. I'm, I'm not sure that he. Uh, one thing I would add to that is that. I didn't mean to cut you off. Is Brittany Carrier in the room? 
No, she had a death in the family. Sorry. Oh, apologize. All right. Um, Brittany Carey, if she were here, I would, I would assume you have something very much to say. I think that the, the interesting thing for me about that project is that, you know, Corb is always seen as someone who was somewhat ahistoric, not interested, you know, but in, in this uh, example, he's actually using and building upon vernacular traditions. And so it, it's, what I find sort of fascinating about the example is that, you know, it's not simply just a white box, again. It's something actually that's, that's being built upon, uh, the vernacular tradition is actually built upon. And so it's not nostalgic, he's not sort of just looking back and building sort of little primitive huts, however they might be. He's not completely ahistoric, building white cubes, and he does as well. Uh, but there's a sort of both and condition, and that seems to me the most sort of productive mode. And it seems more reflective than reflexive. It's not just a knee-jerk reaction, it's actually well considered. It's not unconscious, it's very much within the conscious, it's actually very much uh, thought through. And so I think it's a really interesting example, yeah. and I think Brittany's text on reflexive sustainability would have a lot to say yeah. on that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Leave it there. Um, I think that with something so large in such a space like that, um, it has to be designed with the uh, secondary intent uh, more prominent than the primary and kind of adapt to the um, like the initial use. So, uh, you know, the, it's built for the games, but it should be really built for the community and adapt to the games. So it should be used, uh, you know, they uh, repurpose quite a few of their stadiums that they have now, some that are run down. And, um, they actually started building with the infrastructure in mind and actually kind of like bringing that back up and reconnecting everything and, um, you know, building in specific places where the community needs that. So, um, you know, there's always going to be variables where, you know, something can't be moved. Um, there's a couple of them that can't be moved, but they plan on having, you know, large events happening. But, um, yeah, it's, it's more for, you have to design for the, the long-term intent instead of, you know, the primary. Because, like, if you... Like, as I said earlier in the paper, um, if you look at Athens, like 23 out of 24 of their venues are just sitting there vacant. Uh, there's a couple of them that are being uh, kind of reflexively used, um, mostly by squatters, um, and it's pretty much, you know, it's housing some of the homeless, but it's not a formal, um, it's not a formal use or like a formal repurposing. It's kind of, you know. So, so that's why you'd say that the sock in some way was successful because they were not white elephants in right. the stadiums. They whether or not, I mean, almost there's the question of intent out the window, because it almost doesn't matter what Lake Caduceus' intent was, you know, or what the intent of the designers of the stadium was, this was sort of something that was decided by these, you know, forces beyond architecture. So somewhere, Aldo Rossi just smiled. <laughs> um, this, your, your essay on the on sports stadiums, I think, brings up a few interesting ideas. That uh, the spontaneity, the, 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 the bottom-up, uh, uh, due to the, to the problems of, of, of people who are not uh, in their place, uh, make bring a lot of, of solutions. Maybe in Pesach, if those people ha had the opportunity to work That's more in their houses, maybe today we will have yeah. fantastic Le Corbusier, I don't know if That's Le Corbusier right. houses, but, yeah. but uh, I think that the, Le Corbusier was furious when, when he went to, to see Pesach and, and saw what happened. He said, well, they are alienated people. They, yeah, they don't yeah. understand that something yeah. something's wrong with them, not yeah. with my architecture. And uh, so in, in Cologne, too, is the, I didn't know that case. It's fantastic because it, it's about during 30 years. And, and then the city decided to close the place when it was beginning to, to, to make to be a, a more secure place and, and beginning to produce uh, uh, interesting uh, solutions. I think the, the, the fantastic thing about reflexivity is that we are discussing it, you are students and you are discussing it today, in my times. Nobody yeah, would speak just, about reflexivity or yeah, understand yeah. even the term. It was not needed. Everything has had to be permanent. Yeah. We were working on permanency. And, and the good achievement, it was projects who didn't change. Yeah. I think, as Bob Dylan said in his songs, times are changing. <laughs>
<laughs> I, will, I will say that they will not stop yeah. changing. And that's the important thing, because my, in my times, we say the times are changing, but you are saying they will not stop. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, yes, it makes me, uh, you know, feel that, that uh, the reflexivity is a fantastic way of, sp of speaking about uh, reversibility of, of actions, of, uh, of working in progress as, as a, I don't know, a ping pong play where we can have actions and reactions and, and this is the, the situation where we can find good design in, 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 in the permanent adaptability or, or changing or even reversibility of architectural actions. Um, I'm also glad to see the idea, this kind of concept of reflexivity being used as a, as a way of seeing the world, but I would go back to, I think the point that was really made is that reflexivity is nothing new. It's, it's a natural, it's as natural as the doctor hitting you on the knee and you're, yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's new to, as a sort of a worldview or a way of understanding things. I think there's, and the reason I asked earlier is a good thing, I think that there is a tendency in this class and probably with good reason to look at the, the upside of reflexivity and the wonderful aspects of it and that maybe it's the, the great hope for the 21st century. I think there has not been enough looking at sort of disruptive reflexivities um, and I thought of three cases that, uh, that could have been topics that weren't. One is that of gated communities, one of which is big box retailing and the general drainage of uh, local commerce, and the other is privatization of open space. And actually, the only one of those that was hit in any way was the article about the High Line, which is the, private, is the privatization of open space. Um, and so, who wrote the article about the High Line? Um, do, you, do you understand what I'm saying when I say the privatization of open space in the case of the High Line? I do, like yeah. that it that it's controlled, it's secured, and uh -huh. it closes at 11 p.m. It's not just open all the time. Yeah. It's do you see that problematic, or do you feel like it would be nice if it was open all the time, otherwise it's a... I think that the success of the High Line has a lot to do with that. Um, those the fact that it closed at nighttime? Right, and the security and everything. Um, I would like to see it open. I know it's not, it's not complete yet, and nothing is set in stone right now. So maybe within the future, um, I know I had mentioned something about um, the permission of bikes and animals, like pets aren't really allowed um, to be present at the moment, but in the future, once um, all the vegetation is kind of in place and stuff, those may be permitted. I think that it will alter the, island, the High Line a lot. And um, I don't know if there's any way to foresee what will happen and if it's just kind of like a fad right now. But I think as of late, because of those restrictions, its success is almost, um, like it's, there's no way that it wouldn't be successful with those restrictions. So um, I think leaving it as it is, as an open public space, would kind of show how humans would interact with it. I mean, I don't really, I mean, without those restrictions, I think it would really show the true colors of the nature of humans. So, and especially I, at I night. I want to make a, a quick comment. Um, one of the premises of the whole course was uh, that the strongest example of reflexive mechanisms we have is supply and demand of capitalism, and that uh, left to its own devices, it has actually uh, uh, eliminated any critical possibility of saying this is good or bad, because growth is measured, uh, growth as measured by GDP gives you extra points, not just for goods and services, but also for bads and disservices. They count just as much as goods and services. So it's neutral in the point of whether outcomes are good or bad. So we have planetary death as the result of this, this reflexive mechanism of markets. So this whole thing started 
with the overwhelming evidence of reflexivity has always been going on, just kind of in the background without us talking about it. And part of not talking about it is uh, not passing judgment on the outcomes. And the new era cannot afford to any longer uh, stay silent on judging the outcomes. And so that's kind of a theme that comes out more in my introductory chapter, that design needs to uh, acknowledge the power of these reflexive mechanisms that are so powerful they can destroy a planet. Uh, and that is there, a, you know, we can't, so we have to get in the game and we have to be critical of outcomes. And it's just, that's the reality. So that's kind of. Students of architecture to what, what should we do? Well, the mistake that we're risking just by bringing it up is uh, the same mistake that comes up with computation. Uh, oh, good, we don't have to design. You know, the computers will design, uh, which of course is nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, it's recognizing powerful forces at play and not letting, not continuing to be at their mercy, but actually uh, uh, seize opportunities to make it part of the design process, uh, to design in the uh, acknowledgement of these forces, uh, since they are so powerful. Instead of, uh, I mean, the history of the last few decades, um, one version of the history of the last few decades is architecture was just this kind of thing that happened at the very end of all the important decisions yeah. that were systematically imposed mm -hmm. on the design fields, yeah. rather than leaving the architect just to um, paint the costume, you know, costume the pig at the very last second. Can the architects uh, have a greater influence on how the system operates? Uh, how can the designers? Because I think architecture is too small as it's been redefined in the last I think, years. Robert, I think what you're getting at, and, and I, tell me if uh, you're not getting at this, part of this is um, we use the word agency. It's, uh, this is as much about the practice of architecture and the influence that architects um, are looking to have more of in society. And I think part of that's a reaction to the fact that architects, uh, over the last uh, three or four decades in society, have um, been marginalized in, in the whole you know, political and decision-making process. Um, you know, it's reflected in you know how profitable it is as a business in many ways, and I, I think the subtext here is finding ways uh, that we, as a profession, um, can sort of take back territory and, and, and have have a real influence on society in a way that we really haven't in, in, in many many decades. Why? Because we think you know we have something to contribute, um, but 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 it, I think a lot of this uh, is that a fair Absolutely. characterization. We've, we've been focusing on moments of truth. In the paradigm. What what would that look like? I mean, how do we? How do you? I mean, because I think it brings up an interesting point that we've thought of design in terms of <laughs> objects, things, buildings, you know, iPads, whatever. But you know, how does how does design then operate? In So what's, what's your alternative? Well, I do realize that where we are at today, it's hard to turn back and, and just say, oh, you know, it's illegal now to sell iPhones and shut down Google, but... Um, but don't write anything anymore. You know? <laughs> don't Obviously, write anything. Yeah. Just we're, we're, talk we're, we're all the time. our memories. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I feel that my, um, my ultimate point was more so because now we're looking at even advancing even further in the direction in terms of robotic system, you know, robots in our homes or, you know, devices that clean our houses for us or interactive systems such as walls and ceilings and, you know, exercise systems. And now our refrigerators can tell us, don't pick that cheese, you know, just go out to the store and, you know, we're going to lock this cheese in, it's not for you. Um, I feel like if we just advance further into this direction, it's just going to 
ultimately result in sort of a vegetation rather than the mind. Or if uh, the designers of our technological interfaces are aware and read your chapter and become aware of them, oh my God, what have we done? Okay, quick, let's, we've, let's fix the interaction. This guy, she said that this guy turned right when the computer said turn right and he ended up in the ocean. Okay, let's redesign the interface instead of just being auditory. Let's project the, uh, the advice of the navigation system on each side of the windshield and ask the user, uh, is this the left turn you in intend to take? Uh, that device exists, Robert. It's called the windshield. No, no. <laughs> it projects it's the a, world. It's a, a, <laughs> it's a, real time. Okay. In real time. Yes. And then it becomes enhanced with the navigational interface that says, is this the left turn you want to take up here? And in, in a, it's a heads up display, which they have in uh, cockpits and fighter jets. Or, you know, the refrigerator says, you know, this cheese is, you know, can you smell that? Can you test? Do me a favor, smell that cheese before you, you eat it. Does that smell good to you? Which is what I do with my son. And I kind of feel like I'm empowering him, but also exploiting the fact that his sensory senses are less burned out than mine. You're empowering him to use his own abilities. Right. So it's not all hopeless. You can get beyond the evolutionary handicapping of our technology and have it, you know, have a stronger, faster, smart. I think it really underlies just the power of human choice and how a lot of the ways that technology is advancing nowadays, it's, it's manipulating what someone is able to choose to do. And people are given the choice of whether to turn right or left or pick this cheese or that cheese, but they're becoming so dependent on someone telling them what to do that they forget that they still have the power to make their own choices. So I think that's where reflexivity needs to kind of tone back in that it needs to provide a controlled system while still allowing for like freedom of choice. So it's a more flexible solution into something that isn't going to restrict you to say turn left, but saying here, here's an open space, go wherever you want, but make all the mistakes you have to make, you're gonna eventually have to turn left. <laughs> so it's it's kind of now. saying yeah it's kind of saying like Open make your own mistakes learn from what you've done and then you'll be able to make the right solution without me telling you to turn left so you freak out and you turn left and you go in the wall before the opening. Something so like Kristen, you have something. Um, yeah, I remember during your lecture we had mentioned um, Jean Nouvel's. Um, yeah. Yes, that in Montpellier, it. Um, it's like these two trailer thingies, and initially it wasn't received very well, but giving people the choice of being able to paint a wall made it much more successful. So I feel like going off of what you said about it all comes down to freedom of choice, like you may, you may just need to paint a wall to make it better. Yeah. And I mean, I feel like... He's, he's a very successful architect, clearly, but um, he's not the only one who's doing that. And I feel like a simple change like that is reflexive enough to keep you from driving into an ocean, but it's freedom enough to keep you happy and give you a sense Burn of... power, not handicap. Right, yeah. It makes you feel like the president of your apartment. There was a call for examples, I think. Um, both a victim and a potential victor of reflexivity in the larger picture. So outside of, okay. Um, so they're suffering from this cycle of, you know, people deinvesting in the city and all the car companies doing poorly and all the investment leaving. And then politicians are trying to create change, but then any radical ideas are not accepted by the, the populace in general, so they either don't get implemented and the politicians are then kicked out or scandal kicked out. And you know, this human agency is, keeps butting up against other agencies, and so things just keep getting worse and there's been all these plans and nothing ever happens. And that's why it's a victim. But now there's this hope that things are so bad that maybe now people will finally be willing to take that leap of faith and let 
new program to be implemented. So with the Detroit Works Project, uh, my example, Hail Mary example, is uh, the Detroit 24-7 gaming platform, which was actually developed over at Emerson here. And it's, it's an online platform where people, it's a question answer based platform, and it's not just, where do you hang out? I hang out here. Um, it asks qualitative and quantitative questions. So if you're on a bus and you hear two people and they're looking for jobs, what are advice you give them? Or Susie's daughter likes to dance, what are community programs that you would suggest to her? So it's a way of gathering information um, for the project itself, which is going to use it for planning purposes, but then also, as people are answering these questions, and it's mainly young people, it's mainly 14 to 17 year olds who were engaged in this, they're thinking about their own community, not just what they do, but sort of how they value it, and it becomes reflexive in answering questions, but then also within their own psyche as they become more conscious of the great things about their community and what they should be invested in, and what they spend their time and what's important to them. And, helping bolster their idea of their value system. Because the big problem with Detroit is that you need people who are there to reinvest. In the last 10 years, it was, they've lost 25% of the population, which is absolutely insane. And it can't continue. So before, you can have other people come in with money and help and foundations. You need people who are there to reinvest. One of your, uh, one of your comments in the a quote, if I could, in your essay was that community meetings are a provincial form of uses a half measure to pacify those who desire a democratic planning process. Yes. Um, how do you not make an online community that provincial form of engagement? How does that differ for you? Well, when I was talking about the community meetings, I talked, I was more so focused on when planning was based around just that, where it was just the community meeting. And one of the great things about the Detroit, the Detroit Works Project is that it has over half a dozen ways in which they try and engage the community. Um, so I think that's the main way that it becomes, you know, not provincial, but far more sophisticated in trying to engage multiple demographics. Because community meetings, I mean, you're going to get the diehards are going there. You're not going to have the average person necessarily showing up. So making it easier, which is one thing that the internet really does, is you know, you're sitting at home, you're bored, you can do that, and it's not an inconvenience, and it doesn't feel like you're still there's still that agency there, but it's not as conscious as having to get in your car and drive to a meeting. One of the uh, critiques I would have about that is that it does seem 